This presentation of In Their Own Words is brought to you by The Honor Project and is dedicated to the brave men and women of the United States Armed Forces. The Studies and Observations Group, commonly referred to as SOG, was an innocuous name given to a very deadly program. Even within the military, SOG was a well-kept secret. This covert Joint Service Task Force conducted reconnaissance and acts of guerrilla sabotage behind enemy lines. The six-man teams operated primarily in Cambodia and Laos. They were comprised of American soldiers and specially recruited indigenous mountain natives of Southeast Asia. J.D. Bath was a SOG communications specialist. Well, I just finished a one-year tour in the, the Special Forces Training Group at Fort Bragg. And upon completion, I went into a company, uh, e, e Company 3rd of the 7th, and went over. And I was there probably five months and I received orders to go to Vietnam. And we went into 5th Group at Fort, up in uh, Da Nang, and from there we were uh, sent to... Uh, Cam Duck, from there they moved us down to do two, two different regions, and that was into uh, Kantum and to Fubai. And I ended up on uh, Team Nevada, working as a combo, <laughs> combo man. <laughs> yeah, uh, the teams at that time were named after states in Kantum, and it was called the FOB, then it was later changed to CC Central. But uh, I went to work for a master sergeant named Reno, Nevada is his, his, his team name. And we went into training, I guess. Uh, I'd been climatizing and training with him, learning the hand and arm signals that we use, the radio procedure and what have you. And they were targeted for a mission. And because I'm the young man there, and I didn't have much time on the ground, they uh, told me to stay back. So I went over and worked the combo bunker. They went in, went on the ground, and found a dry hole. They came out and was to be reinserted on a wiretap and uh, en route from one position to the other, the uh, boom on the helicopter spun and broke, broke loose and the chopper augered in and killed everybody aboard. So Reno was killed. And then I, uh, I hung around for a while and uh, Ted Braden and Jim Hetrick came down looking for a combo man. They were developing a team, one of the first teams of mountain yards in the uh, SOG project. And so I signed on with them to be their combo man and we went out recruiting uh, mountain yards. SOG teams use specially trained natives known as mountain yards. J.D. Bath recruited the local natives for special missions. Well, a mountain yard, it's a French word, mountain yard, is a French word meaning mountain people. Uh, of course, the good old American dialect, <laughs> we call it mountain yard, and then we just started calling them yards for short. And they are the uh, jungle people. They live and survive in the jungle. They, uh, they live primitive uh, like the early uh, settlers and probably the, early, the Indians lived out on the plains the way they live. And they're made up primarily the same way, that, like we have the Apache, the Arapaho, uh, Cheyenne, Cherokee, and what have you. They have the Benar, Sedang, uh, Jirai, Bru, Mongs, and they all have their own language. But they can all speak basic Vietnamese, and they just about all speak French. So uh, we work with them and developed a team. And, and it made them competitive against each other, you know. Chirai's not going to hit that target. <laughs> Bernard can't even see that far, you know. This is what they're saying amongst themselves in their dialects and all. And we had an interpreter that could uh, speak the languages, and he get, he established rapport with them right off and got, got over great with the guys, right? And they learned to trust us, and we learned to trust them. And from that humble start, we started going out on the ground and running, and... Uh, 
doing local things to make sure we all understood our immediate action drills and everything. And these guys, uh, you know, they wasn't new to war. It's been a part of their life, all their life, just about. And the, uh, I wasn't able to go out on the first mission they went out on, but the second one I went out with them, and, you know, the chopper went in, sat down, and these guys bailed out the door. They were giggling, almost ready to get on the ground, right? And I, my knees were so weak, I didn't want to get up. I want to go on sick call or something, you know. And as I stepped out the door, the chopper hit this bamboo, and it sounds just like automatic weapons fire. And that didn't help the situation, but I got out on the ground, and we uh, proceeded to move out, and everybody settled down, and we got into uh, our combat mode of moving, right? I mean, we wasn't sent out there to shoot it up with people. If I remember right, that first one, I think, it was a wiretap that we were going out on, and also a BDA. And, of course, the third mission was always to uh, capture a POW if, if one was available, <laughs> you know, yeah. which was hard to get. Oh, we would pick the village, and we would go in, and, of course, you know, uh, you have to go in to see the village chief. And Hetrick and I was doing most of the recruiting, so we would go in and we would talk to the village chiefs, you know, and uh, tell them that we were, you know, we were putting together this team and we would like to get three or four of his young fighting soldiers there or his young people to work with us. And they, most of the time, they were, you know, it was easy to get along with and we would show our gratitude. We would bring in these bolts of material, bright colored material, because they like to make their own clothes, dresses and things, blouses, and they wore for ceremonial only. <laughs> and, uh, but we did walk into one village in which, uh, the, they acted hostile, you know, uh, and we were, we did, this is before we got the new uh, XM-15, which became the car 15 later on, and, you know, we, to show a trust, you leave your weapon outside the door in the chief's house, right? So we did that. We walked up there and, uh, you know, and we, they kind of gruff or come in, you know, that kind of attitude. So we put the weapons down, and but Jim and I both carried nine millimeters in our belts, and we went in and we sat down with the chief and he, his council people and our interpreter, and we explained to him what we were wanting. <laughs> well, yeah, bull, you know what? You're not getting nobody, and we're looking at each other, and both of us, I think the hair was just standing straight out on the back of our necks. You know, we're going to get killed. <laughs> These guys are Viet Cong or something, you know. And so, you know, we were young and just learning, too. And uh, But then we got to talking, and I don't know, somehow it came around about the well, and the uh, this, this man had came that had the round thing on his collar, and they had dug this hole in the ground for a well to get water. And... Uh, he had smoked a pipe, and he uh, he told me he was going to give to me a pipe. He don't give me a pipe. <laughs> so the man, that man spoke with forked tongue. <laughs> anyway, you know we made care on. Oh, you're the guy. Oh, we heard about this. We'll handle this. So we went down to the base exchange and we bought a big can of uh, I think Sir Walter Riley and a big can of Prince Albert smoking tobacco, just tobacco and a couple of pipes, and we brought those back and gave it the village chief, right? Shoot, we could do no wrong after that. Yeah, he was happy now, right? So we got a couple of guys from him, yeah. But uh, and it turned out he turned out to be a real nice guy and all. But we were learning probably as much about them at that time as they were learning about us. For example, that well they dug, they wouldn't drink out of that well. They drank, they may be a dead water buffalo or a dead soldier laying in that creek 50 yards up the river, up the creek from them, but they would drink that water because it's moving. It's, uh, you know, that's good water. This water that stands, it doesn't move, it's, it's not a good water. But to show their appreciation for the well, they uh, um, wash their clothes with it. <laughs> Maybe wash the kids, I don't know. But they had, they had their, uh, their beliefs, their taboos, their traditions, and and we had to learn to live within those, you know, and uh, sometimes it, uh, it really took a lot out of you. They had these, uh, for the, I think it's non-pay. It's a big urn 
and they fill it full of water all the way to the top with rice fermenting in the bottom of it. And as you, you as a guest, right, you come here, you got to have non pay. They've got these long straws that go to the bottom of that choker. They put a, a piece of banana stalk across the top of this thing with a notch in it and a block, that, about that long, I guess. It's about a quart of what you're going to drink to clear the bottom of that thing. And this stuff's kind of sweet tasting. So we sit up there and we drink this stuff, right? And, and these guys would just suck a quart of it down and pass a straw around, you know. And I wasn't really happy about just all of us using that same straw <laughs> and thinking about all the bugs I'm going to get. And anyway, it come around again. I said, well, that sucker's getting around here fast. So I'm watching them. Yeah, they're not using a shorter straw or nothing. And after about the third one of them, I got three quarts of this stuff in my body, and it's got to go somewhere. And it was so sweet, my body began to heave right. So I went out and threw it up. They laughed and rolled around in the floor and thought that was cute. So we went to the store again, and we got some Jim Beam. And we came back, and we popped the lids off. Old American custom. Big swig and pass it around. Now, they could handle that rice wine, but they couldn't handle that Jim Beam. <laughs> so we had kind of a Mexican standoff, you might call it. You know, we, <laughs> we, we could do things together. Then we went to their um, their water buffalo sacrifice. They, that was uh, that was kind of hard to take. You know, they beat the animal down the way they do them and everything. But it's part of their tradition. And uh, then they cut the meat up in little chunks and put it on the end of a long piece of bamboo, and they burn it and give it to you. You know, and it becomes <laughs> it becomes hard to keep down <laughs> sometimes. But those people are just fantastic people. They uh, they were loyal to us, to us as a team, the Americans they work with. Entrenched with the indigenous people, the Studies and Observations Group could get closer to the enemy. The longer we stayed, the bigger pain in the ass we became to the North Vietnamese, till they had to divert a lot of troops to try to run us down over there. And we were given, uh, going in, we were told you know, six months or six missions, and uh, you can, uh, you can go to a training company and, you know, it's up to the individual. Some guys lasted a lot longer. Some guys didn't. They went out on one or two and uh, they come back and said, you know, running that recon wasn't for them. Then the other guys were just dumb enough to keep running and running and running. They liked it, right? I think they liked the time off because once you come back, you get a few days stand out, right? Uh, Which one were you? I was in the middle. <laughs> I... I didn't do that many missions. I kept losing people. Uh, but Ted, uh, on the last mission I went out with Ted, we we were reconning an area and we were watching the trails, you know, counting troops coming by on the trail. And we picked an area to spend the night. And I thought, well, we're safe here. And we woke up during the night, we hear all these voices. And it sounded like we are being overrun. And nobody's shooting, though, you know, and everybody immediately circle your wagons and lock and load and get ready to, for whatever's coming. And we realized, finally, th there was a trail about 10 feet, 15 feet from where we were sleeping. <laughs> you know, and we screwed up. Well, what we had done, we had gone into one area, and we, everybody done, does it. It made it look like we were going to RO in in one given place. Then after it got a little darker, we moved to what we thought was a more secure area, not knowing that this trail wove around through the boonies and come right out behind where we was going. And these guys would walk along out behind this thing talking and all, you know. So there we were, Parker Factor to the max. <laughs> then what would you do? Well, we just stayed real quiet, <laughs> made noise like acorns. <laughs> and... Uh, we waited them out. Well, we started trying to count them and get an idea of the type of weapons they carried, you know. And their spirits were high and all this. And figuring the time of night, they wasn't going to be going much further because about first light, the uh, first aircraft are usually coming into the area, hunting them. And uh, figuring that the speed of march and all, they were going maybe another couple of miles. But there again in the hilly country, they had cut... Uh, they cut notches of steps in the side of hills, right? Whereby we we couldn't use the steps. We're out in the boonies trying to get up the side of this hill, and 
you know, you got a heavy load on your rucksack and you're trying to get up about two thirds of the way up, everything lets go and you go sliding back down that slimy hill and you finally say to hell with it. If I meet him, I'm gonna kill him and you get on the trail and go on up, get up the top of that damn thing. <laughs> After completing his initial tour, Bath went back to Vietnam to participate in some of SOG's most daring missions. 71, I went back to Vietnam, back to the SOG project. This time I was up in CCN, and uh, we had uh, we had a couple of operations going on. We had, uh, what did I do? Why'd you go back? Because the Army wanted me to. <laughs> well, no, I, I didn't mind going back. I had, I had done three years in the... Uh, in Germany, I had, uh, in addition to myself being in Special Forces, I had two brothers, Ronnie, the young lieutenant, he was with a play coup Mike Force. He later went back as a pilot and a chopper. Mickey, my youngest brother, was stationed down close to Four Corps area outside of Saigon, Three Corps, Four Corps area. Uh, and one brother was in the Navy Seabees. He's the one that went out and pushed the runways out where they put in A camps and all. So we kind of had the war tied up. <laughs> but we were supposed to only be one of us in the country at a time, but we uh, we were getting by till Mama found out about it. <laughs> yeah, she raised a little hell. But uh, I was on my way back from Germany going to Vietnam, and my younger brother, Mickey, extended at six months. And so they wouldn't let me stay in Germany six more months. They said, go to the States and find a home. I came to Fort Bragg and went on the HALO committee as an instructor. I stayed there just about a year, I guess, and then I got my orders and went on to Vietnam and uh, did a year. But I did, uh, I didn't run a team this time. They, they had some, I'd seen such a change. The first time I was in country, you know, everything's being run by the old hands. And this time I come in over there and the young guys, and they're good, they, uh, they uh, were doing a damn fine job running recon. They were all E4, E5s, and E6s. And uh, they just, they didn't need any help, you know, except maybe logistically because they did a darn good job over there. And it was, it was odd and it was kind of funny too. Some of these guys were hippies. Now, they got pictures of themselves, right? Long hair, beards, the beads, the whole nine yards, and they got drafted. They went in the service and they said, well, hell, if I'm going in the service, I want the best they got, right, in the military, in the army. So they came in special forces and uh, they soldiered. And they died just like, the, the, you know, that bullet don't care who you who you might be. And they fought just as hard as anybody else over there. Did a darn good job. The uh, But I went on two major gigs over there, one of them being a POW stat that turned into a piece of crap. Uh, Which one was that? Well, we were going into, uh, I think, Happy Valley. We were going in and set up on a trail and use uh, debt charges. Just put them on both sides of the trail. When the people walk down through them, you set it off and it knocks them out, you know, and you try to police up a couple of POWs if they don't kill them all. And we were moving through pretty good and here come a loach. A loach is a small bubble nose helicopter and we all waved at the guy, you know, and they're the, they're the lead man in a pink team. Pink team is two cobras and a loach. And what he does is he bird dogs, he's hunting, and he would blow the grass down. If he found people, he'd throw smoke and run out of the way, and uh, the cobras would come in and gun it. And we just kind of waved at the guys he went across. You know, the next thing we know, here he come back the other way, and he had a 60 mounted. And he went popping right down through us with that 60. And the only thing that really saved us, he rolled out before he got his smoke off. And the centrifugal force carried the smoke outside of our perimeter. And that's where the guy put his first guns. He was, I mean, hosing it down bad. They had their guard frequency turned down to where they didn't, they were just talking back and forth amongst themselves. And uh, they started punching rockets on us and just doing a damn number on us. Believe it or not, they didn't kill any of us. They hurt a bunch of us, but uh, the, uh, I'm These trying These were to, Americans. Yeah, and, you know, well, Larry Manus, uh, Larry, we call him the world's tallest midget, right? 
He's blonde haired. He jumped up, you know, threw his hat off and pulled his shirt open. They use him as an aiming stick. <laughs> and punched a rocket in. That rocket got most of us. Andre Smith had a rucksack full of uh, C4 claymores and everything else. And he's trying to push them away from himself. And he got hit. Uh, it just, uh, you know, it was just a bad day. But what really saved our bacon is that lead made his run, and he rolled out to gum up to turn around and come back, and this third cobra came on line and run right in behind him and told him to go high and dry. As he made his turn to come back, he was going to put nails on us, those flechettes. He was going to scatter them amongst us. And this gun rolled in behind him and said, go high and dry. Those are friendlies. You're shooting up friendlies. And the... Pilot replied, my hire says they are no friendlies in this AO. And our boy says, be advised, you continue this pass, I will engage you. And he rolled out, right? And then when he rolled around and see that we were America's down, well, then he became upset. And what it came down to is when you're, uh, you know, prior to going out on a mission, you don't just put this thing together and go do it. You've got to advise, or you've got to get the blessings, more or less, of people down south. You had to notify what they call up, down, across, you know, the bottom, right? Everybody had to, to know, they had a reason to know that you were going to be in that on that piece of real estate because if they didn't know, somebody could make a mistake, and this was just one of those mistakes. An intel sergeant forgot to post it on their given map that that was going to be a, a, a area of occupation that day. And so the guy burned into us a little bit, but... Uh, he landed his, when he landed his chopper, the hatchet force team, react team, were all sitting there waiting. And when he landed, you know, he threw the canopy back and threw his helmet as far as he could throw it, screaming he was wanting to go kick somebody's ass, right? Well, now he just became friends because these guys were ready to shoot him out of the cabin, out of the cockpit of that thing if he had killed any of us out there. Bath also made one of the first high altitude, low opening or halo parachute jumps. Oh, then later on, uh, we had an area, things were getting hot by now. I mean, we're, you know, we're getting run off before we can even get teams on the ground. And we had a situation where we put a team in, they were on the ground 45 minutes and got run back to the chopper to the site and got out. The next team going in several weeks later, they didn't even get off of the chopper. They came under such intense fire. Uh, they pulled out and they decided to send a halo team in. And Billy Wall, Andre Smith, and uh, Strohlein and Campbell were on the team. And I was, I don't know, I went down to Saigon and I decided to go on down to Long Time where they were doing their jumps. And I strapped on a rig and just started jumping with them. And, uh, Andre got hurt uh, on one of the training jumps. We jumped into, I went with them. We went out into what they call the Iron Triangle. It was a hot piece of real estate. It always was. They had uh, sprayed it and killed all the trees and all, but it's still being used. But uh, we made an insert into that area, and uh, everybody landed and got together. Andre's back was hurt. He couldn't go, so they moved me into his position, base man position. What we were using... Is this you've seen these on the end of a flashlight? You see them at the international airports, those flag things they use. Well, these were the flat green ones, and they had found that they could sew it into the pack tray and attach wiring and tie the wiring into the bottom of the light and run it to a flashlight where you could turn it on and off and control it. And then they sewed one on the top of the canopy itself, which after you, you turn the one on your pack tray off open your canopy, and then this one would open up, you'd turn that one on, and the guy stacked above you could follow you to the ground. And it worked, you know, we made some dark jumps out there and it worked and everything, and then we made the hot jump. Uh, that was a go-getter. We, we had, I think, three stand-downs, if I remember right, and it took us two weeks to get the jump off. By then, I was ready to get off get off of it because uh, the longer you hung around doing something in Vietnam, the, the quicker the North Vietnamese found out about it. You know, and they had established a pattern using that C-130 every night, flying to and from Thailand 
at the same altitude, so it looked like it, it was a new habit, right? But they just shrugged it off as that bird going over again. And we flew out, and that first night I was up, we, I'm right on the edge of the tailgate, ready to step off, asking myself, what in the hell am I doing here? I don't, I shouldn't be here. And this cloud cover came under. Well, here we're pumped. We're ready to get off the bird, you know. And, and I look around at the jump master. It's the guy that's in charge of that bird at that given moment, who happened to be Larry Manis. And Larry got up, and he's just shaking his head no and moving to the front of the aircraft. So I stepped back up, and they closed the bird up. And then the next time we dressed out for it, got to the tailgate, and we sat there for a few hours and never loaded. And I think oh, the third time we jumped, yeah. So the third time we went up and uh, we got out. Everything was working good. The green weenie was working all right. And we went into free fall and I'm watching the bird and I can see the other jumpers coming off and I turned around to locate where we're going to get on the ground because you can't track at night. Once you, with all that cargo, equi combat equipment you got and all you want to do is stay stable. And uh, I just burrowed down. I went through their altitude that they're to pull, like at 3,000. I started clicking on and off. Then at 500 feet, I, I mean 2,500 feet, I turned mine off and dumped my parachute. Then I clicked on the uh, green light on top of the canopy. But when this thing opened, these canopies were old. They had been used quite a bit. They'd been in the wire. They'd been patched. And the whole top of mine just disintegrated. I mean, I got... I, <laughs> I got a big window up here where I don't need one, right? And I'm looking around and I, I see the guys over here and I'm thinking, they're not stacking. You know, they're, they're moving in the wrong directions and I'm watching my rig here and this thing, it, it's just shuddering and fluffing, right? The, the busted material in it. And so I started trying to turn it and I'm not getting any drive and I'm, now I've got to make decisions back to me, right? And, catch up with them later and I'm watching the altimeter and I'm not really dropping that fast I said well I'm wired to this damn thing to start with and you know, I'd have to do a lot of cutting things away reach up here and cut both sides away at the same time get the reserve out and that's called the last hope rope and <laughs> get it out and if uh, that I, I would probably still hit the grain, ground at the same speed that I would have under the busted rig there so I decided to ride it in, and so I went through all the procedures, you know, and I kept watching those guys, and they're still staying in that same area. They're just bird-dogging back and forth, but they're not working like they should have been stacking on top of me to come right in on top of me. And I dropped my, I released my rucksack. It's on a 15-foot line. You don't want to try to not land with that thing and break a leg with it. I dropped it down, and um, coming on, I could feel the temperature change. It was getting warmer and warmer, you know, and I figured my chances of hitting a tree are pretty damn good, you know, out here in the jungle. And I'd be damned if I didn't almost miss that tree. But I hit enough into it, the tree limbs, that I went down through them, and it slowed me down. And I, was, I did this kind of a number like that, protecting myself, right? And, and things are catching, and I'm beating, hammering, and banging. I got thrown sideways and slapped in the face and all. And uh, then all of a sudden, I'm back in free fall. And before you know, before you could do anything, I hit again. And that time, the lights went out a little bit. And I finally got my senses about me. I was laying backwards, around, kind of around a tree with all that equipment on me. And I set up, you know, and I'm, I'm trying to put everything back in focus. I grabbed that little night device, light device we had, and I'm looking, you know, and I can't see any lights out there. Nobody's coming in my direction. And I could hear a dog barking way off out there someplace, but I started trying to, to cut all the stuff off, all these uh, suspension lines and all, and I <laughs> I've been on wiretaps, right? And I know that those lines are heavily monitored. And I grabbed this line and I cut and I'm like, what the hell is that? And I fell over it in this wire. You know, and my brain's still addled enough. I said, oh, shit. I've just cut a damn combo cable in two. They know I'm here now. <laughs> you know? We carried, uh, we carried the high standard Silence 22 pistol. The silence were on it like so. Well, this thing was in a bungee system on my reserve, and when I came down through that tree bouncing around, it came out, and it was just 
man, and I put my hands down. And I said, what's that? And I wrote a round barrel. I got my car 15 still tied to me over here, right? I said, shit, <laughs> I'm in trouble. <laughs> you know, that's a gun. <laughs> then I realized, oh, that's that pistol, right? But I mean, that's how screwed up it was, you know, at that time. And anyway, I got out of the gear and you thought it was a gun of an NVA. Yeah, I didn't know, you know, it's a gun. What's it, what's it doing pointing at me, right? You know, and your heart just, uh, I mean, all the guys got to do is squeeze the trigger and you've been shot. And a, many, a million things go through your mind at that given moment. Think, did I land on top of this guy or something? You know, it, really. Anyway, I uh, got out of the gear and my mouth was all busted up and and I went to get up and this leg wouldn't function. So I said, oh boy. And the pants leg was ripped up on it. And my back hurt. I thought, I think I'm gonna quit. <laughs> but I come up on the radio and I'm trying to reach the other guys. And, and I, uh, we were using the first letter of our last names like, like we were an aircraft or something. You know, I'm Bravo Flight, uh, Stroline Sierra Flight, Campbell Charlie Flight, Wallace Whiskey Flight, right? And so I came up on the radio, and I couldn't get anybody. Then all of a sudden, I could hear Strohline. He's calling me, and and I told him, I said, "Well, I've you know I've busted up a landing gear. I hit pretty hard. And I've got a busted landing gear, meaning a busted leg." And he said, "Yeah, I'm hanging around right now. I've, um, I've got a right wing that uh, it's non-functional. He broke his right arm, and he's hanging in that damn tree." And I had no idea which direction he could be for me at that time. And uh, so the Les Chapman, I think, was flying Covey for us. Les started putting a package together, get air rescue, you know, the rescue teams, the bright light teams, we called them, get those on site and get ready to get these people off the ground. Uh, and they brought the choppers in, the guns and everything, and everybody was trying to help. They come over me a couple of times, and I tell them, you know, they were looking for Strohline, and I, because these guys hurt, and I told them, I said, you know, I'm Bravo, and they move on, and then people started coming down into the area. People started moving down North Vietnamese was moving in on us. And I figured, well, damn, you know, <laughs> this is gonna be a bad day at Black Rock. So I'm putting up claymores and stuff like this, and so the birds have been there long enough. I could hear Strohline talking to them. He would. Uh, He'd say, break right, break right. He, he would catch one through the trees and, and try to get him to break right and bring him right over him. Well, the guy might break right, but then he had no other direction. He might, he might come by over here and Strohline couldn't see him. But what, what had happened, we, have a, we had a tubular nylon rope that was packed into our, between our pack tray on our parachute and our backs. And you'd pull out the end of it and you'd snap it in uh, the snap link on it, snap it into your risers, right, on your parachute. And then you'd go down under your foot and bring this out and it takes both hands. One hand you'd clench it off, the other hand you'd reach up here and release yourself from your parachute. Now what you got left is your reserve and just your harness and your parachute, which is hung in the tree, is now your anchor. And you start letting yourself down and work yourself down out of the tree, but with a busted arm, he couldn't get out of that tree. So, you know, anyway, the birds uh, were hunting him and running back and forth, and they began to get low on fuel. And they came over me, and uh, a guy by the name of Lemuel McLaughlin and a medic named uh, Mac, no, Woodard, I think was his name, or something like that. Anyway, he got out of the Army, and he's an outstanding doctor somewhere up in Connecticut or Massachusetts, doctor or dentist, did good for himself. Uh, anyhow, uh, they strung me up on a rope and got me out of there, flew me out, and they put me in the hospital, let me lay around there for about three or four days. <laughs> and they brought me out of there, and I uh, spent the rest of my tour there, and I come on back to the U.S. of A. But fellow jumper, Madison Stroline, did not survive the mission. They found his weapon and his map and his night scope laying on the ground at the base of that tree. The tree had been shot all to hell. They had taken the canopy out of the tree and everything. His weapon had one round, one round had ricocheted off the side of it. Uh, that might be that he had it hanging in the tree and they shot it, because what he'd done, he throwed smoke. I forgot to tell that. He, uh, thought, he thought that maybe throwing out smoke, the smoke would uh, show him where he was, but unfortunately, you get smoke in those trees and it would just get up and just hang there, 
right? And they become a calling card for everybody but the people you need. The team, everybody had to come in. It was getting dark, and they told him they was going to have to leave him. You know, it was all day run out there. They couldn't get to him. Uh, so they come back the following morning. They captured him alive. They executed him later on because we were wearing a that Air Force survival vest, and it's got all these pockets on it. Well, any time you go out, you know, your map goes here, your compass goes here, your morphine pills or whatever goes here, your salt pills, blah, 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 right? But every man was dressed exactly alike. Now, you have that map up here where it's easy to pull it out to look at it. Now, if they'd have shot him while he was in the tree, then there would have been holes in either the, the night device or the map itself. But they were laying there, and there was no blood around the base of the uh, tree. In fact, I heard just just about three or four years ago that the recovery team had been in there and they had interviewed an old Vietnamese that lived there that remembered the incident and said, yeah, they, he remembered when they, they captured the American. They said, well, what'd they do with him? He said, they executed him. Because under a parachute, they immediately think you're a pilot. And a pilot doesn't have a long life if captured by those people, not by village people anyway, you know, jeez. Hmm. Well, it was quite a time in SOG. Yeah, well, you know, I, I just, I played a small part in it. But what the, some people say, oh, we, we're heroes. We're not heroes. To me, the hero was that guy that, that knew he was surrounded and he stacked his magazines and his hand grenades and he took them with him as long as he was alive, right? But we learned, you know, none, none, nobody came back, you know, out of, off of the ground. They captured them, and if they captured them, they executed them. Nobody made it. As a SOG team leader in 1969 and 1970, Bill Deasy experienced enough horror to last him a lifetime. Whenever he crossed enemy lines, he was determined to be silent and sure-footed. It's body language, it's uh, hand signals, Occasionally there might be a, a light whisper. Uh, a lot of it is just a sense, watching somebody, somebody's movements, somebody abruptly stopping, uh, watching the uh, elongated stare at a particular location. Um, there are many ways, very subtle ways there. It's not verbal. You never talk at all, really, when you're out in the bush. It's, uh, as, as other facets, you don't do. There are do's and do nots. And one of the big do nots is uh, verbally communicating when you're out in the field. Why, so, what are some of the other do-nots and why, why, what's the origin of those do-nots? Oh, moving quickly, uh, being complacent. Uh, one of the worst things you could do is think that the enemy's not around, that you're running into what they would call a dry hole. And there have been teams that have taken uh, devastating uh, beatings from thinking that they were in uh, safe havens. You know, they might spend a day or two in there and they haven't seen anything, haven't crossed any trails that look like they were actively used. Uh, have not seen any uh, bunker complexes. Uh, this would make you complacent, or it could make you complacent if you didn't have some experience behind you or some savvy about you. Uh, you always assume that the bad guy was there. You moved very deliberately, uh, very slowly. Uh, you would move maybe for five minutes, you would stop. And when I say move, I'm talking about very deliberately lifting your feet and putting it down uh, in a precise manner. You may want to walk in where the other man's footprint might be on the ground as well. Um, when you come across a trail, you may back off on that trail. You would not negotiate that trail. Certainly, you would never traverse on that trail. But before crossing it, you might want to back off, observe the trail for a while, listen for sounds. That was another key thing I always thought, was you always listened, and you wanted to hear the natural sounds of birds, of maybe the monkeys in the trees, of insects. Uh, normally, if you didn't hear that, there was something that might be uh, going on. There may be an ambush being set up. Uh, people might be in a place which uh, frightens the animals themselves there. They may be super quiet. So if you heard super quiet, normally uh, something was amiss uh, in that situation there. Uh, another thing uh, you'd have to be careful of, you wouldn't go to sleep at night. Um, I think people have mentioned to you probably before, you would go into kind of a, a semi-coma type of state you would relax, you would lay there. Once you went into your RON, your rest of a night period, and I was normally in the very thickest of terrains or the most difficult terrain that somebody other than you would try to get to you, you would hear them, and that was the key to it. Make them trigger some kind of a sound trying to get to you, sneak up to you at night. But you would never take off your rucksack, you would loosen it, 
and you would lie against it. Now the straps might be down by the uh, elbow areas. Uh, your weapon, you never put away. You never put it on the ground. You always had it across your lap. Um, and you would listen. Before you went to sleep, your backs would be in a semicircle. You would put out your claymores and your defensive perimeters. Um, and uh, you would just sit there maybe for an hour, two hours. And that's if you could go to sleep. You may fall asleep for a little bit. But no, the entire team was never sleeping or relaxing. I, I won't even use the word sleeping because you didn't sleep. Um, you were relaxing, but you never relaxed at the same time. And then the slightest sound, and a lot of times you can hear the monkeys in the trees or uh, some of the birds maybe making some noises or some of the insects at night. You would listen for that, and you wanted to hear that. And if you didn't hear that, uh, you would get ready maybe that you were going to be coming under attack very shortly. Uh, another uh, don't, I would say you had to be very careful going to the bathroom. That was something that was uh, natural if you're out in the woods for a certain amount of days. Uh, I would eat uh, maybe what they would call lerps, which were dehydrated food, or MREs, which were the same thing but a different type of flavor. And I might have a bag last, which and each one was meant to be a meal in itself. I might make that bag last uh, two days. I would just eat a little bit of it and, and uh, put it away take it out maybe later on in the evening and eat a little bit of that. And uh, I would keep it for the next day and take me two days to finish something that was supposed to be one meal. And two reasons I did that. One was to cut down the amount of matter that I had in my system, which would reduce the chance that uh, I would have to turn around and uh, uh, use the local facilities. I didn't like walking off by myself. And uh, another, I guess, don't you would say would be, uh, oh, there was so many of them. Uh, Again, just don't relax too much. Always be diligent. Always expect that you were going to run into the enemy or the, run, the enemy was following you. And if you did that, if you were on your guard, you had a better chance of, of getting out of any given situation. With most of the area crawling with enemy troops, it seemed futile to even drop into the landing zone. A lot of the inserts uh, that I experienced uh, were pretty fire free. I have run into some where we couldn't even get on the ground. Uh, I think there was one I'm going to uh, uh, mention when I was operating out of CCN. I was operating with uh, my one zip, uh, who was an excellent uh, team leader and a good friend. His name was uh, Kirby Smith. Uh, Kirby Smith and I attempted to go into this one area over in Laos. And as the uh, choppers uh, were making their final run to insert us, they dropped down a treetop level and they were running probably 90 or 100 miles an hour gunning it and we're just about hitting the trees with the uh the landing booms on the on the uh helicopter as i was hanging out the right door ready to jump off um i noticed all of these buildings and activity right inside the tree line this might have been recessed 20 or 25 yards uh within the tree line and there were uh the buildings were bunkers some of them looked like they was two-story i mean they were huge and i did see some activity as the chopper, I, I was saying to myself, I can't believe they're really going to put us down in here because it's quite obvious this place is saturated with NBA soldiers. Uh, the chopper flared as it was just about to make the landing on the LZ, and it was elephant grass in this open area. Uh, there were people waiting in the elephant grass, laying down, actually waiting for us to come right over there, and they started shooting at us. People in a tree line opened up, and it became quite obvious to the, the chopper crews, the CNC ship, and to each of the team members that this isn't really what we want to do. We don't want to land here today. They own this backyard. So uh, we started returning fire and we uh, exfiltrated from the area, went, went back to the launch site. And when we landed, we found out there were 11 bullet holes. Fortunately, nobody had been hit. But that was probably one of the most hazardous inserts that I had experienced myself. Uh, most of the time, it was the, uh, the extracts that uh, got a little bit hot and hairy. With the busy fall season just around the corner, you might be looking for wholesome, convenient meals for jam-packed days. Factor, America's number one ready-to-eat meal kit, can help you fuel up fast with chef-prepared, dietitian approved ready-to-eat meals delivered straight to your door. You'll save time, eat well, and stay on track with your healthy lifestyle. Too busy with your end-of-summer goals to cook but want to make sure you're eating well? With Factor, skip the extra trip to the grocery store and the chopping, prepping, and cleaning up too, while still getting the flavor and nutritional quality you need. Factor's fresh, never-frozen meals are ready in just two minutes 
So all you have to do is heat and enjoy, then get back to crushing your goals. Level up with Gourmet Plus options prepared to perfection by chefs and ready to eat in record time. Treat yourself to upscale meals with premium ingredients like broccolini, leeks, truffle butter, and asparagus. With Factor, you can rest assured you're making a sustainable choice. We offset 100% of our delivery emissions, source 100% renewable electricity for our production sites and offices, and feature sustainably sourced seafood in our meals. This August, get Factor and enjoy eating well without the hassle. Simply choose your meals and enjoy fresh, flavor-packed meals delivered to your door. Ready in just two minutes, no prep, no mess. Head to factormeals.com slash warriors50 and use code warriors50 to get 50% off. That's code warriors50 at factormeals.com slash warriors50 to get 50% off. On one mission, DC was nearly killed by a freak accident while escaping the clutches of the enemy. I had just gotten out of uh, uh, the dispensary where I had malaria uh, on a previous local mission. Uh, I didn't, you don't bring ponchos or poncho liners. You don't use mosquito uh, repellent. At least I didn't be, for fear somebody might pick up the scent. So uh, one night I was out with uh, a mountain yard team and I was doing a local. And I remember uh, going through agony that night as the mosquitoes turned around and set upon me. And, uh, oh, they were starting to bite everywhere, and they was biting my face, my head, my neck, my lips. I remember trying to bring up my jungle jacket, my fatigue, and put it over my head, and they were biting right through it. So anyway, uh, I uh, went back in the next day there, and my head looked like a basketball. So a short time after that, a friend of mine, my, my hooch mate, who was a, a great fellow by the name of Jack Damoth, said, uh, Bill, you should go up to the dispensary. And I had just been sitting in a chair with no energy whatsoever. So he took me up there, and uh, it was discovered that I had uh, 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 malaria. So I spent about a week or so in the hospital. When I get out, they said, all right, Bill, uh, to get you back into the, uh, uh, you know, the feel of things again, we're going to put you with uh, two fellas. One was uh, named Bob, Ma- uh, Bob Malone and Ernie Massey. So we were supposed to do an area recon. I think it was down around Parrot's. Uh, beak area, which was not a, a friendly, receptive place to be going to. So I said, sure, I'll, I'll go in with the two fellows. So we went in, we're inserted one afternoon. We did a, a very slow area recon of this particular region. Uh, went into our RON area that night. And uh, the next morning, uh, we get out and we started continuing our recon area of the area. Uh, I think it was somewhere around noontime. Uh, we were walking on the side of a ridge line, and uh, we saw some buildings down below us in, a, in kind of a shallow, uh, well camouflaged, and it was obvious it was an NBA uh, bunker area. Uh, we started descending this slight slope, and we noticed uh, some NBA moving through the area, and they immediately turned and looked up at us. Um, we did an immediate I, uh, IA drill. And then we started DD mowing real quick, running up the hill and then sideways on this ridge. Uh, they started pursuing us, some of the other fellows that were down below the NBA. And uh, the chase was on and we had a running firefight. We finally w- went, oh, a couple hundred meters and we came to a, a semi clearing on a side of a hill. So we called for an extraction, which we had been when we started running from the, uh, the bunker complex. And uh, uh, the slicks, uh, we set up a defensive perimeter around this clearing area, and we waited for the, uh, the ships to come and get us, the ships being the slicks, which would actually uh, we'd board and get out of the area, and also either the, uh, the gunships, which were going to be Cobras, or they were going to be other UEs with some heavy uh, ordnance on board. The, uh, the slicks came in, but they couldn't set down. Uh, when it wasn't that large of a, uh, a clearing that they could put down a couple of ships, and second reason, it was on kind of a slopey area. So they dropped uh, rope ladders, and rope ladders was one of the means that we could be, you know, extracted by. Um, we let the yards go up first, and then uh, Bob Malone ascended the ladder and was getting into the chopper. Rope ladders are very difficult. Uh, they have also aluminum ladders, but the aluminum ladders are more fixed. There's l- less flexibility. A rope ladder, actually, when you're climbing up, it wants to swing underneath the chopper, so you're coming up at an angle. Very difficult when you have about 70 pounds of 
equipment on your back and a rifle and all this stuff. So uh, I was the last one ascending the ladder. I think Ernie Massey was ahead of me. And I was putting down some uh, covering fire into the immediate wood line where the muzzle flashes were coming at us. Um, I would say I was halfway up the ladder and the chopper started to rise and lift off. You could see he wanted to take off. So my intention at that point was to just snap in, which was not unusual. It, in certain situations when you're under fire, you wanted the, the chopper to leave as quickly as possible. So I would ride out and ride back to the camp, you know, just snap linked into the, uh, uh, the ladder. Unfortunately, when I was about halfway up there and I was starting to snap link in, uh, I heard a loud boom. And immediately the chopper started twisting, doing 360s and just flailing all over the place. Um, my own thought was, as I was holding onto the ladder and being swung around, was to uh, immediately get out from underneath the chopper because I knew, I didn't stop and think, I didn't reason, I just knew instantaneous, this thing's coming down, you can't be underneath it when it, when it hits. Uh, whatever happened, the next thing I remember um, was I was laying uh, next to the chopper, some feet away, and I remember laying there, and it was tremendous heat. I had been knocked unconscious. What, apparently what happened was the land, when it landed was a part of the chopper, came down, uh, hit my skull, jammed my head down, slammed me down and slammed me on my right side. It fractured my skull and knocked all my right teeth out. Um, screwed up my spine, as I found out later through the years there, uh, to some vertebrae. It was called axial compression. And uh, so I was laying there next to it and... I aroused to tremendous heat, and I could feel it mostly on my left side. And as tremendous heat, um, I said, I have to get out of here. I have to get out of here. And, uh, you know, I didn't stop to think that, hey, this chop is on fire. I just knew that there was something that was drastically wrong. I wasn't thinking coherently. I tried to get out and move, but I was entangled in the rope ladder. And I was partially underneath the chopper, so my legs were caught underneath the... Uh, one part of the, the chopper, I'm not sure which. Uh, two of the fellas started to come down to try to get me out, and they tried to untangle my legs, but it was so hot, uh, they went back to you know where they were, probably some 20 yards away. Uh, one of the fellas I heard, or I was told later, uh, said, we're gonna have to shoot him. And I think the intent is, somebody at once mentioned to me was to uh, you know, pull a bullet in my head rather than let me burn to death. But uh, one or two of the fellas said, let's try one more time. And one of the fellas was one of the crew members. He was a door gunner by the name of uh, O'Kelly. And another fellow was named Ernie Massey, who was my team member. And they came down and they tried one more time and they untangled my legs and then they started uh, moving away quickly because it was very high. But I remember crawling away from the chopper um, at that particular time. Anyway, the gunships were coming in and they were putting down suppressive fire all around us at this particular time. Uh, particularly the uh, the wood line where we'd come out of from that bunker complex. Um, they dropped, they came in because they couldn't land, and they dropped stable rigs. Stable rigs are those 100-foot ropes that come in, and you have a harness on, and you could snap link into. And then they pull you up over the tree line, hopefully, and then uh, move out. They dropped three of them, and I remember what they said to me, and I don't know why. They said, uh, wrap your arms around uh, this fellow's neck. What happened was the uh, door gunner, or the aircraft crew member, O'Kelly snap linked in one of the stable rigs. I didn't snap link in. I just uh, put my arms around his neck and straddled him, put my, wrapped my legs around his hips, and I was going to come out like that. So the chopper lifted off, and we were extracted out, Another chopper came in, dropped more stable rigs, and the rest of the team came out. Uh, as we were uh, heading back to the launch site, and I believe it was going to be an A camp uh, at that particular time, the closest A camp we can go back in, in South Vietnam, uh, I remember my head was on O'Kelly's chest, and I was, I was losing blood, and I started slipping down his body. I was losing my strength. And uh, I remember looking down at the jungle, and it was a terrible feeling. It, I could see it and I said, I think I'm gonna fall from a thousand feet or 3,000 feet, whatever we were at. Uh, and uh, 
So the, the ride back was going progressive. You're doing about 90 knots or maybe 95 or 100 miles an hour. The wind is thrashing your bodies around. Uh, I'm slipping down. And finally, I think my hands were just on O'Kelly's neck. And I think my head was down by his belly button or his abdomen. And I just said to him, I said, please don't drop me. And I heard him grunt a little bit. And I think the weight, the tremendous weight of me being on him and then his harness through his abdominal region was causing him a lot of distress, a lot of pain. And I don't remember saying anything, but I remember tremendous arms underneath my armpits holding me. And then I remember touching down on the uh, PCP at the, uh, the A camp and being laid out. And I remember the medics coming over and putting IVs into me. And I remember uh, having one of the fellas, a group of faces staring down at me. And one of the fellas was smoking. And I think that was Bob Malone. And I asked him for a drag. And I remember taking a drag, and that was the last thing I remembered uh, until I wound up in the hospital. DC was soon back in action and faced the most horrifying experience of his life. And then my hooch mate, a very good friend of mine, and still is today uh, by the name of Jack Damoth, uh, who I think the world of, uh, said, Bill, uh, we just came out of a mission here. We tried to grab a POW. He said it didn't work out, uh, but we had to kill him. He said, we're going back in a few days. Would you, be, would you be interested in going back out on another mission with us? So I didn't, I didn't really hesitate. I said, sure, that'd be my, my, uh, the best next mission I could have, going out with Jack. So uh, I had another couple of days to heal up a little bit, and I was, I was almost there. And so I went out with uh, a, the team, uh, I believe it was Level, and it was uh, Joe Bertoni. Bertoni uh, was the team leader. Then it was a fellow by the name of uh, Lancelot, right? And another great man by the name of uh, Croft, Crofton and uh, Jack Damon and myself. And what the mission was, we were supposed to go back to the same trail. And it was in Cambodia. And we were supposed to try and pull out a POW, which they wanted badly because we didn't know in a couple of weeks after this mission, uh, they were going to have the Cambodian incursion. And they wanted somebody to give them some fresh intel about what's going on up and down the trail. So anyway, uh, we were inserted in uh, somewhere around noontime. And we made it to this trail. We had to walk X number of clicks. We had just been inserted in a different grid. And the grid is a certain block of area where, where different teams would work. So uh, we landed in this one grid. Uh, we walked... I don't know how many clicks it was, maybe four or five maybe clicks, and uh, it was fairly easy terrain that we can get through. So we observed this, this trail for a couple of hours, and uh, it was starting to get dusk, and we hadn't seen any activity on it. And finally, uh, the team leader, uh, Joe Bertoni, had decided that why don't we set up on it, just in case when it's getting darker, somebody will be traversing the, uh, the trail. So anyway, uh, we did that, and Jack Damoth... And one of the yards was going to be uh, the rear security, and Jack had the radio, and he was going to stay a couple of hundred yards, maybe a hundred yards off the trail uh, with a yard. Uh, the right flank security was going to be a fellow by the name of Lancelot. In the kill team, the kill team was the guys that were actually trying to, going to sit right close up to the trail and try to, if there were more than one, if there was one NBA walking by, jump out and grab him. If... There were more than that. Uh, the kill team then would select which fellas, if there was numbers, which ones they would have to shoot and incapacitate and which soldier we were going to try and pull out. Uh, so that was uh, Joe Bertoni, uh, one of the yards called, uh, the interpreter called Idrun, and another fellow by the name of uh, uh, Crofton. And I was going to be the right flank security. Now in this area, it was fairly sparse. There wasn't a lot of heavy vegetation. Uh, so the, uh, the flank security elements, Lancelot on the right and myself, were going to be quite a distance away from the, the kill team. And I picked an area on a trail, probably off the trail, maybe about five yards, maybe four yards, but there was a tree there. And that's what I thought, and there was some elephant grass. I imagined that if I was by the tree and they were coming from my left, which... I would be the first one to see them, and I was down in the grass a little bit, I'd be fairly well uh, concealed. To make a, a long story short, it wasn't long. As soon as we set up, uh, I would say we weren't there more than five minutes, 
and I looked to the left up the trail, and I could see um, approximately five or six troops, I believe it was, coming down. They had pith helmets on. Some of them had bicycles. Uh, bicycles were loaded with materials on either side. Unfortunately for us, what I noticed was that they were walking uh, the bikes from the far side of us, which meant that they would be facing us as they were going by. And what they did is they had one hand on the handlebar and one hand on their AK-47s or 50s on the seats. So uh, I was watching them, watching them coming up, coming up, going by, and I remember having the gun ready to, to do a spray real quick if they looked over and they spotted me. Fortunately, uh, as they were going by, now I'm getting anxious, I'm breathing, I'm aware that within a matter of seconds, there's going to be a lot of gunfire, and it's going to be death. Now, I knew this. So as they're going by, I'm watching, I'm watching, and they're passing me, and they're just starting to come up into the kill zone upon a kill team. Uh, as I turn and look to my left up the trail, all I could see was a column and pith helmets and pith helmets and pith helmets. And as far as I could see were these heads bobbing up and down walking. And they were behind the... The lead element, I'd say a point squad, by maybe, oh, maybe 20 meters or something along that line. So they were, they were starting to come up, and I'm saying to myself now, uh, it, it's too late. They can't see them. Now, the fellows that are on a kill team can't see that far up the trail because it, it turned somewhat. They, their field of view might have been, oh, maybe... 10 yards or something of this nature, but they were concentrating on the five or six guys that were just coming up on them. I was saying to myself, please God, don't let them jump up and try and grab these fellas because they're not aware of this large column of NBA right behind them. Um, as it turned out, the next thing I heard, now I'm watching peripherally out of the right corner of my eye, these fellas going into the kill zone, but I'm concentrating on this large group just coming up on me now. And uh, uh, next thing I remember hearing was the uh, most god-awful sound I ever heard. It was a human shriek. And what had happened, I believe, was that as the NBA squad, the point element, was right in the kill zone, our kill team was just starting to, to move, stand up and move. And they were just starting to draw down and pick out who they were going to shoot. One of those NBA saw them coming and realized, I believe, that death, he was going to die. And he reacted verbally to that. And again, it was a shriek I'll never forget. Never heard anything like it before. Never heard anything like it since. But as soon as that happened, I knew it was over. The kill team opened up. I opened up on the column coming down. And they were just about on me, but it was, there was someone off to the left. I remember firing, uh, you know, frantically uh, up and down, just swinging it as much as I could, uh, emptied the magazine, threw another one in real quick, the same thing. And then uh, one, of the, one of the, I saw some kind of action coming out of the, uh, the kill zone, and uh, what happened was I swung my, my gun back again, the car 15 back, point, gonna point it down this way, because it was f fairly close over here. As I did, I fired, because it was an NBA fellow coming out, the last one had got escaped the, uh, the kill team. And, uh, uh, he fired, he was firing at me and I fired at him. And next thing I knew, um, my gun wouldn't work. So I'm saying to myself, what's the matter? Why is this thing broken? And I looked down at my car 15 and, uh, I saw blood flowing down. I saw blood all over these, these stock and I, I saw a bullet, uh, sticking out of it, out of the side of, of the, the bevel, which was a, a round metal piece right uh, in front of the stock, right behind the receiver assembly. I said, what is that? And I said, did my rifle, mal my first thought was my rifle malfunctioned and something blew out there. Uh, and uh, then it dawned on me that the bullet that the fellow had fired, and I had fired at him and shot him and killed him. I saw one of the bullets turn around and shatter his face. Um, I stood there and I was kind of in semi-shock saying, now I'm defenseless. I grabbed the grenade real quick and I threw it up the trail. At that time, I turned to my right again and I saw the, the kill team uh, retreating back towards the rallying point, back to where Jack, Jack uh, Damoth was waiting with the other yard. 
and we had uh, cached our, our rucksacks up there at that time. Um, as we ran back, uh, I knew I was going to be almost uh, not useless, but I didn't have a, a functional weapon. So I just grabbed the grenade and I had it at the ready and I went out on the perimeter. As I ran back, Jack Damon saw me holding my head sideways and, and the blood coming out. And uh, uh, he said, Billy, come here, bandage, let me bandage it. And I said, no, it's okay. So anyway, I took a, a position on, on a perimeter defense. Uh, at that time, uh, if the discussion was realized that uh, um, one of the members was missing and uh, he can only be up by the trail. And the missing member was Idrun, the interpreter. And what had happened uh, during the course of the firefight, Idrun had taken a bullet in the back as he turned to, to run. So immediately, uh, a great man, great soldier, uh, very diligent, and uh, you know, I think very highly of him, by the name of David Crofton, without hesitation, still taking fire, ran out in the middle of this and ran up to the trail, picked up Idrun, and brought him back uh, to the defensive perimeter. Uh, he was rewarded the Silver Star for that, and certainly he deserved at least the Silver Star for that. He has my utmost respect, because I know it wasn't an easy thing to do, but it was, it was so uh, it exemplified the spirit and, and the type of personnel that were going out and doing these type of missions there. Uh, we had Jack had called, as soon as the firing started, he had called for an extraction. The choppers came in. Uh, I remember the fact above us, uh, was circling and we kept on saying that you know the, the trail is loaded the trail is loaded and he was trying to locate us and everything else and you can hear the franticness in his voice the pleading of tell me let me find you so i can help you he finally did he started making rocket runs because uh the uh, sky masters or the ov2s uh, push pull aircraft uh, had rocket pots on and they can give you uh, cover with uh, the rocket pots and that's what he started doing making uh, runs and keeping the enemy at bay somewhat the uh, slicks came in and we were extracted all fairly safely. Uh, when we went back, they took, they flew me uh, right to a, uh, and he drew right to a, a hospital downtown in a Bami Tuit area where they, I was treated and released because I had received shrapnel wounds to the side of the face from uh, the, the bullet jacket and part of the, the weaponry. He drew was uh, uh, hospitalized there for some time uh, with the gunshot wound. When I went back to the site, uh, um, the team was just returning, had just returned at Bami to it and were on a tarmac and I had walked up to them and uh, they were telling their stories as I walked up there and I had the, the rifle with the bullets sticking out and I had the bandages all on the face and everything else. And uh, everybody was so happy, but it came out that Lancelot also had been wounded. He had a bullet grazed his nose, took out a piece of his nose. Uh, Bertoni had uh, a couple of bullet holes. We had... Uh, uh, Cravettes around our neck, uh, which were basically long handkerchiefs, green OD, and you would normally have one around your forehead to uh, to keep you from sweating. Number one, number two, uh, it gave you some form of uh, camouflage, and also if you needed a bandage or somebody got one, you could rip it off and use it as a, a tourniquet or whatever. And you also had one around your neck, but he had a couple of bullet holes through the tail ends of the uh, cravat around his neck. Uh, so, but it was uh, not a successful POW snatch. But we felt it was successful just to get out of there underneath uh, uh, the conditions that existed. There were uh, probably, I, I don't know the exact number, but there had to be 100, at least 100 NBA coming down that trail. And uh, to come so close, we were so close to them. Uh, it's amazing that we didn't take heavier casualties. We hope you've enjoyed this presentation of In Their Own Words. This program was created and produced by First Person Productions in association with the Documentary Broadcasting Company. The stories told herein were supplied by The Honor Project. Produced by David Benson. Content written and produced by Dave Barsky. Engineered by Greg Bartheld and Brian Donovan. Narrated by Bill Ratner. This production is copywritten by First Person Productions Incorporated. Any unauthorized broadcast, public performance, or copying is a violation of applicable laws. Step back in time and discover the untold stories of history's greatest heroes. 
From ancient civilizations to modern times, the Anthology of Heroes podcast takes you on a journey through history, uncovering the bravery and determination of those who stood up for what they believed in. These aren't just stories from old history books, they're the human experiences of those who fought for justice, freedom, and their principles. From the defiance of Vercingetorix as he stood against Rome, to the unwavering spirit of Skanderbeg as he faced down the Ottoman Empire, each episode is a journey through their life as we follow their triumphs and their failures. Meticulously researched with quotes and observations from primary sources, Anthology of Heroes is the perfect blend of expert research and engaging storytelling. So listen and subscribe now on your favorite podcasting app.